Hello, welcome to New Harvest Christian Fellowship, Manchester, England, and thank you for subscribing to our sermon podcast. The message you're about to hear was recorded live at one of our recent services. We pray it will be a blessing to your life, and if you'd like to get in touch with us, we'll give you our contact information at the end of the recording. Thank you once again. Enjoy the preaching. Hum, if you don't read that and you want to say, well, how do you, how do you, which book is that? Because we don't often use that book very often. Nahum chapter 1. Our text verse is what I call a sweet little verse. We oftentimes have to take the whole context of a passage to understand it, but there are sometimes nuggets that are just nestled into the context of the passage. That's the case here. If you read the entire book of Nahum, specifically the first chapter, there's lots of things said about God and by God, and many of them are very strong. It talks about God's wrath, God's judgment, God avenging certain people. It talks about how God can be during certain times and certain situations. But here there's this sweet little verse that almost seems out of place when you look at all of the strong language that's being used. But it shows and it demonstrates that our God, while he is hard to describe, has not only a strong side, but he has a side that's appealing to even unsaved people. And I want to read with you today this one simple verse, Nahum chapter 1 and verse 7. And really I want you just to see the specific uh, phrase right at the beginning of the verse. It says, the Lord is good. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. And he knows those who trust him. I just want to say, I'm not going to talk about this, but he knows those who trust him. Sometimes people say they're trusting God and they're not getting blessed. Things aren't happening in their life. And they make you feel as if something's wrong with you, the church, or something else. And sometimes it's just they don't trust God, but they act like they trust God. God knows. That's why you don't want to fake certain things in the kingdom of God. Trust is one of those. But this statement here, the Lord is good, is often stated by Christians. They'll make this statement, God is good. And then you'll hear people chime in after. They'll say, all the time. God is good all the time. And that's an important concept, important understanding to know. Sometimes we trivialize that, and I want you to know that it's way more than just using those words, God is good. And so I want to zero in today on the goodness of God. And start off with by just making this simple statement, but important for you to know that God is good. God is good. This is super important for you to understand the how and the why. How is God good and why is God good? And so I'm going to give you a couple of verses. These verses have a little bit of theology. Everybody say theology. Theology means theo, God. Ology is study of, so it's the study of God. And everybody says they want to know theology. I want to know what the Bible says. I want to know what the Bible means. But then when you start teaching them theology, they kind of nod off, and they're kind of like, so I'm going to do what I did with my kids when they were young, and they wouldn't eat their vegetables. I'd say, here, here's a vegetable. Eat this little one right here. Start with this. Did it with my grandson. I'd take him out to eat. He loved to go out to eat with his grandpa, and we'd go out to eat, and I'd buy him his meat and rice that he loved, chicken and rice. He'd fit in right here with you guys, because a lot of you all just eat chicken and rice all the time. He loved it, chicken and rice, but I'd give him a little bit of vegetables on there. He'd, no, grandpa, not the vegetables. I'd say, okay, look at one carrot, bro, just one carrot little sliver of broccoli, and he could handle it. That's how the theology is going to be today. You need theology. You need to know what God is all about. You need to know the God you serve. This is not a religion. 
This is not just an organization where we come together and we practice our religion. It's beyond that. It's about knowing God and God knowing you. And so here's the verses I want you to see today. Psalms 86 and verse 5. For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive and abundant in mercy to all those who call upon you. Let's give you the next verse. Psalms 100 and verse number 5. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. Now, you've heard this before. You hear people every now and then, especially in times of catastrophe or problems in a country, they'll say, you know, uh, mankind is basically good. They'll make that statement that at the core of mankind, they are good. But I want you to know they've got it wrong. They've, they've, They've got it wrong. Mankind is essentially bad, morally wrong. Most people... If they, were, if they knew no consequences would occur by their wrong behavior, they would choose wrong over right every time. Every time. If I was to leave my wallet here and um, pretending it had lots of money in it, and I left my wallet here, and I just left it there, and you knew that no one would ever know No one would ever know. No, I mean really no one would ever know. And that it was there. And you could just take it and get away with it. Most people would do that. Most people would take that if they knew that they would never get caught. Now, I know some of you say, no, we'd never do that to you, Pastor. We'd never rob you. Oh, yes, you would. The reality is when we are alone, we often do things that we wouldn't do I'm taking my walks. I know y'all. Right? <laughs> but in many instances, listen to this, it's important. Many people do good things. We had a terrible tragedy here in 2017. We had the Manchester Arena bombing. It was a horrible thing. If you are, live in Manchester, most of you do. It's just a terrible terrible thing. And I remember uh, the day after uh, going down to the uh, Albert Square, and I, a, a lot of people, religious leaders gathered from all different kinds of religions. Uh, political leaders were there. So many people from all around Manchester and outside of Manchester came. There were thousands in Albert Square there. And I, I remember thinking, I'm so proud to be part of the Manchester community. I remember thinking like, wow, these people are here doing good things. People have laid aside so many things to be able to do good things. But you know, as we broke up and we started going, the, 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 the meeting broke up, and as we started walking away, you know, people started breaking out their cigarettes and some had their cans of beer. They started cussing. A couple of people started arguing a little bit. And all of a sudden, now the bad things start coming out. I'm sure many of them went home and did morally wrong things after doing such good things. My point being is that when we say man is basically good, that's not true. Man is basically bad who is capable of doing good things. And the reason I need you to know this is because God is not like that in his goodness. God is inherently good at his core. God does the right thing. If it was just me and God in the room, I could leave my wallet out all the time because God would never, ever, ever do wrong. That's the God you serve. That's the God I serve. He never does wrong. And I know all of you kind of know that conceptually, but I need you to get it into your heart. I want you to think about it in another way. God is permanently good. Permanently. See, I can do a lot of things for a little while. But doing something permanently, man, that's tough. Some of you are going to make some New Year's resolutions. You want them to be permanent, and I have no doubt you mean them. But making something permanent, even for a long period, of, is almost impossible. It's almost impossible for us. But God, on the other hand, is permanently good. That means no matter what you do, he's good. 
how bad the world is getting, he is good. No matter what hasn't happened in your life, he is good. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. Since this is true, that God is good, you have to understand that he also gives good things. God gives good things. Not just every now and then, because he's not like man. He gives good things all of the time because he cannot do anything other than be good. No matter what you're going through, no matter what situation you're in, you need to look for the goodness of God and that he is going to give you good things. Matthew chapter 7 and verse number 11 says this, You then, therefore, if you then, therefore... We're good? All right. Thank you. He's caring about my looks, huh? We all good? Anything else you wanted to... Some things I can't... I just got a haircut yesterday. It looks pretty good, yeah? (laughs) Thank you, sir. (laughs) If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children... How much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? I think we should constantly be asking God for good gifts. We'll talk about why and how and he, why sometimes it doesn't happen the way we want. But I think that's what we should be saying. God, I, I want your blessing. God, I want your favor. God, I want your help. God, I want your providence. God, I need you to do this. God, please do this. Open this door. Change my heart. Whatever the case is, God gives good gifts. The Bible says, James chapter 1 and verse 17 says, Whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God, our Father, who created all the lights in heaven. He never changes or casts a shifting shadow. He never changes. He doesn't even have a variance of change. He doesn't even change his shadow to being like, oh, wait, was was that a good gift from God? No. It's always the same, and that's so exciting in a generation where people change. Do you know people that one day they're nice and brilliant and excited and you love them and you can't wait to be around them and then the next day for no reason that you know of they're just all of a sudden have changed and become like somebody that you'd rather not know? There are so many people that are like that. They, they're one day, they're nice. You're thinking, wow, they are so pleasant. I wish I could be around them all the time, only to find the next time, sometimes the next service, they come, and and they're not even, you're you're wondering, like, who are you, you know? uh, Did someone just, like, unzip that, take that person out, put a new person in that same body? Because they're always changing. They do nice things and then do evil things. And if you're honest, you're a lot the same way. One day you're worshiping God, praising God, want to serve God. The next day you hate things of God. You don't want to do the things of God. You're tired of the things of God. You're lazy in the things of God. Can you say amen? God never changes. He gives good things. So here we're going to progress, get into some biblical logic here. If God is good and you ask him, the good God, for something, and he doesn't give it to you, or he gives you something else, that means that the thing you were asking for wasn't good. Think about that for a second. I want that to sink in. If you ask the good God, who never changes, for a good thing, and you don't get it, or he says, no, not that, here's this, then that means the thing you were asking for wasn't good. Oh, it might have been pleasant, it might have been desirable, it might have been the thing you want, but it wasn't good at its core. And boy, this is where I want your thinking to totally begin to change here. Sometimes things might be good for some person, but not good for you. If you're a diabetic here today, and you have insulin shots that you take, that insulin is good for you. You need to take your insulin 
Your body's not producing it because of the fall, because of sin, because of all these things. We have sicknesses in our body. And some of you have problems with your uh, insulin counts. And so you take insulin, and that helps you. Now, me, I don't have that problem. If I was to take your insulin and get your insulin, it would be a hormone that I wouldn't need and could do bad things to me. So sometimes some things that you may pray for may be good for somebody, but not for other things. God, I'm praying that I would get married in 2019. Now, for some of you, God's saying, amen, we're going to work on that. For others of you, he's saying, no way, no way, you're not ready. You're going to mess somebody else's life up, and I'm not going to let you mess two lives up. And the list can go on and on. And my point being that some of you are praying for some things, and you're wondering, why hasn't God answered? Why hasn't God come through? What is it that's not happening the way that I see it? Because it's not good. It may be what you want, but God never says, I'll just give you what you want. Father Christmas does that, but God doesn't. Actually, Father Christmas doesn't do that. They just say he does that. My point being, God gives good things. What you've received from God, you say, that's good. If this past year has been a time of lack, you haven't had all that you think you need it. And I say think you need it because we say we need things and we don't always need things. If it's been a time of lack, there's good things in that. Even the Apostle Paul says, hey, I've learned to be content whether I have a lot or whether I have little in want or lack or want or abundance. It doesn't matter. I wonder if you understand that God has given you good things. Not only does God give good things, but God does good things. So look at God is good, God gives good things, God does good things. One of the major differences between the God of the Bible and the God of other religions is our God acts. That's one of the major differences. Almost every religion you see, it's just a formality, it's just a ceremony that they go through. It's just a certain set of rules and incantations that they follow. Sometimes it's praying a certain number of times per day, just a ritual that they go through. Other people, it's having an introspective time where they sit and they meditate and they go through certain things, you know, where they just begin to think about what's going on inwardly. But it has nothing to do with a real God who really does something. You know, I've been a pastor a long time, and I met a lot of people who said they do a lot of things, but very few of them do it. They just talk about it. Sometimes that's a result of the God they serve. They talk, but they don't do. The God of the Bible is a God who does. Which God do you serve? The God who does, because you'll be a representation of him. Let's move on, move on quick. More specifically, not only is he a God of action, but he's a God who acts on the, for the benefit of his people, on behalf of his people. This is totally different from any religion that you see. You see those who do believe in a deity, do believe in a God, usually their God acts totally based on their own feelings. If they're angry and they have fury, then they pour out that fury upon their subjects and they're just supposed to be able to take that. You don't see that in the Bible. Matter of fact, you see opposite things. You see a God who is a God of patience and love and kindness uh, and demonstrates and does great things for his people because he's a good God who gives good things and does good things. Hang in there with me. We're going somewhere. See, if you've grown impatient over God not moving as you wish, that is not a problem with God. It is a problem with you. It is a problem with you. See, an impatient person never moves God to action. God just doesn't go, oh, I'm sorry, were you waiting there? Oh, I, I, I didn't know, are, are, are you fed up with me now? Oh, come on, don't be like that. Come on, I'll do it for you now. It's not the kind of God we serve, but that's how people live. That's how somebody, some uh, people act as if God is. 
See, panic mode is not godly mode. And sometimes we come to God, we wait until we're in panic mode, and then we're just, God, come on, God, please, God, this. And God's saying, look, your panic doesn't move me. Are you with me? Your plight might move him, but your panic never will because panic is the opposite of faith. It's the opposite of belief. It's the opposite of trust. (laughs) See, when it seems that God is slow to act, I want you to take a deep spiritual breath. 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 (laughs) And I want you to begin to assess things according to the truth. Not according to what you feel, but according to the truth of things. For example, God, what is it that I need from you? I need you to do this. And then you ask yourself, is that in accordance with his nature? Like, God, my my neighbor next door has really bugged me. I don't mind if you kill them. That's fine. You can get rid of them. If you want to, you you know, cut their hand off, that's fine. That's cool. That's against his nature. That's against his nature. Then you have to begin to look, is it in accordance with his standard of righteousness? See, people can be in sexual immoral relations and constantly saying, God, bless our sexually immoral relationship. And God says, I'm never ever going to bless that because it's not in accordance with my uh, uh, standard of righteousness. So you have to ask yourself, whenever you're in panic mode or worried or thinking that God is not doing something, you have to start to ask yourself these kinds of questions. The other questions you need to ask when it seems as if God's not moving at your pace, is the timing right for you? Is the timing right for you? You know, one thing I've learned about serving God for a number of years is that as I'm going forward, the timing always seems wrong. God never seems to be doing things in times that seem right to me. That's the honest truth. And I'm close to God. I think I am. I feel like I am. It's never like that. But when I look back at my life, oh, man, thank God he didn't give me what I prayed for there. Thank God this took forever to happen. There was a time frame that was beyond my kind of understanding. So you have to ask yourself, is the timing right for you? The other thing I want you to think about when you're in that mode of God seeming, seemingly slow to act is you begin to ask yourself, how will, if God gives me this, How will this affect others? How will this affect others? You know, for those of us that are like in uh, ministry that has a lot of connections to people, uh, almost any change you make is going to affect others. It it almost is. And I don't want to go into too much detail, but some people have asked, "Why, why didn't you come to Manchester sooner? Because there was lots of people involved. There was lots of uh, of players that were going to be affected by the change, some for the good, some not for the good in the way that they saw it. And my point being is that that's why you have to say, okay, God, how is this going to affect other people? And then you have to look at this and say, okay, if I get what I want or I want what I want, how does this affect God's ultimate plan? Because the more immature we are, the tendency we have to only be concerned with the immediate plan, the picture that we can see, the picture that affects us directly. And rarely do we concern ourselves with the bigger picture. I think I've said this before, that I spend a, a lot of my time trying to get people to see the bigger picture, trying to get them to not just focus and lock in on what is going on in their life, but trying to see the bigger picture of what God's doing. Are you with me here today? God gives good things. The Bible says in the book of Psalms, chapter 119 and verse 68. I've always liked the 119th Psalm because it's got big numbers. The 119th Psalm. And then it's got verses like 142, you know, big numbers. And it says, you are good, and you do good. That's what I've been preaching for the last 10 minutes. But then it says, teach me your statutes, your decrees, your laws, the things that you say are important for me to know. 
our response to his goodness should be, let me know more of you. And so oftentimes we get less and less of God's goodness because we're just becoming more and more selfish as time goes on. I want more of you. God, you're good, you're good. Your word says you're good, and because you're good, give me some of your goodness. I want a little of your goodness. Fill my, my pot with some of your golden goodness. And God's saying, wait a minute, I've already given you goodness. What have you learned from the goodness? Not learned about you, not learned about life, but learned about me. See, the psalmist had it right. You are good. You do good. Now let me learn from you. Teach me. See, waiting for God to act is often a lesson on who God is. Sometimes we just want to know who God is by reading it plain in the Bible. Give me a plain verse that just tells me everything I need to know about God. Give me a one-stop shop, a turnkey operation with God. God says it doesn't work like that for many reasons that I can't go into today. But the bottom line is waiting on God is where you learn about God. And that's what our scripture says today boils down to this when we talk about God giving good things and God doing good things is do you believe that God does good things? Do you believe that? Okay, we had a lot of amens. I'm assuming that many of you meant that and you were sincere with that. Now, do you trust him when he is silent? Do you trust him when he is silent? See, sometimes people aren't, or personalities are different and during different seasons. And God, uh, above all, is like that because he knows what we need. But we can relate to that even in our personal relationship. Gracie knows me very well in that, you know, when we're around, I'm talking. I'm always talking to her, saying certain things. And I'll ask her questions. I'll give her teachings. And she'll be like rolling her eyes like, here he goes again. Because I know I'm a little bit obsessive on that. And I apologize for my spiritual OCD condition, you know. But it's how I is. So, uh, So here's what happens. What if I'm quiet? What's wrong with you? What's happening? Why are you quiet? What's going on? Because there's a change. God, on the other hand, sometimes is quiet. He doesn't say anything doesn't mean he's not doing anything. doesn't mean that he doesn't care about you. It doesn't mean that he's trying to withhold good things. The scripture says the opposite, Psalms 84, that if we do what's right, he will withhold no good thing. So do you believe that God does good things, and do you trust him when he is silent? Now let's move on to this last and final point here today. And I always hate to say the most important thing in a message because the most important thing in a message is the one that impacted your life, the one that you need. So uh, I I guess to me, this is the most important point. And that is that not only does God, not only is God good, not only does he give good things, and not only does he do good things, uh, but God promises good things. See, you can judge a person by the things they promise. I know some people that they say things like this. They say, if you do that one more time, I'm going to hurt you. That's their promise. Their promises are, if you don't stop it, I'm going to knock your block off. There was an American television show. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. It's the Jackie Gleason show. It was in the 1950s, big, heavy-set guy. And he would sing a song, How Sweet It Is, you know. And my dad loved him. And uh, he, had, he was a big, big guy, you know. And uh, he had this little skinny wife on his television show. And she would get under his skin all the time. And she'd say, he'd say, Alice, I'm going to send you to the moon. I was thinking today, I go, man, they would never allow that show on television today. (laughs) But you can judge a person by their promises. If a person always promises to do bad things or hurtful things or selfish things, you know how they are. Some people try to even make biblical out of their negativity, and they'll say, an eye for an eye. It's in the Bible. Yeah, that's the only verse you know, isn't it? That and Jesus, that verse and the verse that says Jesus drank wine. Those are the only two verses that anybody ever knows, you know, are those ones. <laughs> they twist both of those out of context. 
But you compare that to someone who says words like this, promises, I will love you all the days of my life. I can remember telling Gracie, and I know I talk about my marriage too much, but it's my, probably my most important relationship that I have. And I can remember in Oxnard, California, we had been saved not too long, and I remember opening up the door for her right after a conference, and I told her, I said, Grace, and this is how we talk in California, I said, I will never burn you. I will never burn you. I will never steal from you. I'll never rip you off. And I meant that. I told her when I was 19 years old, I'm a kind guy. I'm going to show you how good of a guy I am. And I know I sound like I'm bragging, but my po- I am bragging, I guess. <laughs> how about things like, hey, if anything goes wrong, I promise to be there for you. So you judge a person by their promises. God should be judged the same way, by his promises. We all live our lives based on promises. Those of you that are about ready to go back to work, if you haven't gone back to work already, are going to go back to work with the promise of reward called money. You're all going to do it. You wouldn't do it for free. You wouldn't do it for free, and I don't blame you. But on the other hand, you don't work one minute and then get paid for one minute. Work one hour, then get paid one hour. You don't even work one day and get paid one day. Matter of fact, people who get paid like that are called day laborers and often looked upon as not that committed to work. It's not true, but it's sometimes how people view it. My point being is that you work with the promise that at the end of the month you will get paid for that length of time that you work. God promises reward for those who trust him, but later on, it's a promise. The scripture says in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 6, but without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, he is, so is means a lot of things there, but in our context, he is good, let's say that, and then it says, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So if you diligently seek God, is his promise true that he will reward you? We know the scripture says that, but I want you to understand in the context of what we're talking about, God is good and he promises good things. See, understand that, again, I just want you to get this whole concept that I know I'm going over and over, but it's important. Travel tickets are promised a promise that when you show up sometime in the future, you will be allowed to board to your destination. God's word is sometimes just like that. He says, I promise you this. doesn't give it to you instantly, yet most Christians want it instantly. Most Christians demand it instantly. There's a whole theological bent that says you can demand of God and he will move. I Understand their thinking, but I don't agree with all that. Not everything can be attained instantly. The promise matters. The thought here that I want you to get is that your future, 2019 and beyond, depends on the promises of a good God. A little bit of theology. There are 700 promises in the New Testament alone. 700. Hundred promises. I, I doubt many of you have read your Bible today and thought, wow, is that a promise? You should, though. Many of you have read your Bible, but you're not reading in the context that there are so many promises. So with that said, I want to look at just, uh, again, 700. I don't have time to go through even a, a smidgen of them. But there are what I would consider important promises that God makes to us. And I realize that some of you have had a tough year, a tough 2018. It might not even go down as your best year ever. It might have been a big struggle. I really do understand that, and I do feel for you, but I'm not going to pity you. Understand that there is a promise for you. The book of Matthew, chapter 5, and verse number 12, says, Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. 
You say, wow, I haven't got my needs met this year. Man, I've gotten opposition, a lot of pushback, a lot of reversals, a lot of things that I thought were blessings ended up not being blessings and maybe even went further and worked like curses. There's a reward for you waiting in heaven. Somebody's saying, well, that's, that's too long. I don't want to wait till heaven. I understand that, and there's many scriptures that speak to us that we don't have to wait to heaven, but what if you do? Worst case scenario. You have to wait until heaven to get blessed. Is that worth it? I mean, when you're talking, if you live a long time on planet Earth, you live 100 years. Most people live about 70, 80 years. And that's just 70, 80 years, 100 years if you've lived a long time. Compared to eternity, you had to wait. If you're 30 years old, you had to wait 40, 50 years to get blessed for the rest of your days. That promise is pretty important when you think about it like that. That one, no matter what you're going through now, will for sure be dealt with in heaven. Great is your reward in heaven. The Bible tells us this, for those of us who don't want to wait that long. <laughs> Mark chapter 9 and verse 23, Jesus said to him, If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. That makes me want to be able to go ahead and say to myself, no matter what I'm going through, I have to believe. I have to believe. I have to have faith. I have to have trust. And if something you think is good, something you think is of God, something you think God is wanting of you to do, you pray about that and you believe until he shows you otherwise. And that's okay. Once he shows you otherwise, drop it like it's a hot potato. I was thinking of that scripture we have up there. I didn't mention it, but now to him who is able to do far more abundantly, far more abundantly than all that should be all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. There's in another one of our little problems in dealing with God is good is that we think because God is good and because he acts and because he gives and because he does that we're just waiting on God to do something, waiting on for him to come in and fix it come and take care of it. And sometimes it's already in you. Sometimes the power that you need to endure, to endure or withstand, the power that you need to understand, the choices that need to be made are in your lap, on your plate. And that power is already working in you. That's what God is all about. Do you believe he can do all things? Here's what the scripture says in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. He's already blessed us. Now, here, here's the final question I want to ask you about God's promises and God doing and God giving good things is are you only asking for material things? I know if you're in a country where the economy is totally devastated by war or famine or what have you, those material things are of utmost importance. No no problem with me on that. If you totally have no food and you need food, it doesn't matter if you have joy. It matters if you have food, doesn't it? But for us that live in countries like Great Britain, we have most of those things. Tax dollars, tax money, rather, pays for all of that to have enough. Mostly what we say we don't have is because a result is a result of our bad decisions, our bad choices, and we're wanting our, you know, people, well, I don't want to get into that. Thank you, Lord, for giving me that. 
That's self-control right there, not to say that. <laughs> but see, now it's in my mind. I want to say it so badly. <laughs> I just want to say it, but I'm not going to say that. I, I, I do want to tell you, though, that sometimes that's what we're so focused on, and we should be focusing on spiritual blessings like joy and peace. Hey, God, just give me, maybe I'm not going to have more money this year. Maybe you're going to be made redundant this year. And no one likes that, but if it happens, what's your attitude? What's your attitude? My point in trying to end this year is that God is good. God is good. He doesn't do good things this and here and there. He is good, inherently good. Got to get that concept first. Then when you look at that, that whatever he's given you is a good thing. If he's given you a weight, that's a good thing. If he's given you less than what you wanted, that's a good thing. If he didn't give you anything, that's a good thing. He's a good God. And those promises, man, those are good promises. Those are good, good promises. You know one thing, uh, I, and I'm not sure how it works here, but they, the lottery in the U.S., and, and, and I hate the lottery, man. Don't buy lottery tickets. See, I don't care what they say it's for. It's messing up the planet. But the people who win the lottery, they have two choices in the U.S. You can get it all in one lump sum, or you can get it over like a 10-year period. And every person that I've ever read about has always taken the one lump sum. I, I think that's probably because they don't trust the government. That's probably why, you know. But the idea that you would wait and get it over a 10-year period, you would make far more money if you did it that way. But people never do that because they don't like the idea of future. They want immediate. Christians are no different. We want immediate gratification rather than future gratification. That's why if you're single here, and we constantly, well, we don't constantly, but we do tell you, hey, you know what, Keep, maintain your sexuality. Stay sexually moral until you get married. It, it'll be worth it. It'll be worth it. It may not be worth it in the ways that you think, but it'll be worth it in your marriage in the long run. The payoff is big. The future promises. And I've got so much more I, I want to preach, but I'm going to have to stop and tell you that this is the end of our year and the beginning of our future. The end of our year and the beginning of our future. And that's a wonderful thought, concept today. Can you say amen? amen. Give the Lord a big hand clap today. If you've been blessed or challenged by today's preaching and you'd like to get in touch with us, the easiest way is via our website at www.newharvestuk.com. You can email us at info at newharvestuk.com or look us up on Facebook or Twitter. You can call us on 0161 278 6305, or you can even write to us at 194 Chapel Street, Salford, Manchester, M36BY. We'd also like to extend a warm welcome for you to join us at any of our services. However you might be feeling, and whatever you might have been told, know this. God loves you, and there's a place for you in his kingdom. God bless you. We're praying for you, and once again, thank you for listening.